There we go. Okay. So let's begin now. Um, first thing that we wanted to uh, present to you today was that uh, we have a new website at caeai.com or CAE Associates that we're very excited about. Uh, if you have not had a chance to visit it recently, it went online about uh, two weeks ago. Uh, and it has a uh, new look and feel to it and a lot of additional uh, features and, uh, and information on it. So if you get an opportunity, please go and, and check it out. Again, the web address is the same, caeai.com. Uh, there you'll find uh, things like our expanded resource library. Uh, there's a new uh, training registration and calendar view that makes things a lot easier to find the classes that you need. Uh, and we've also started an Engineering Advantage blog where we are picking particular topics and writing a brief uh, blog description on those. You'll, you'll find that the various uh, people throughout CAE are contributing to that. So if you get an opportunity, again, please uh, visit the new website. Feel free to comment on the blog. So we'd like these to be as interactive and as useful as possible uh, for our user community. Uh, any comments you may have on the blog, please uh, forward them to uh, Christina Capasso at uh, CAE Associates as she is the new website manager. Well, we'll be talking about the Assembly Manager today, and again, this is another one of our continuing e-learning webinar series. Uh, many of you have attended uh, these in the past. Uh, uh, if you happen to be new to these, uh, you can find uh, past recordings of our webinar series on this website, uh, caeai.com. Just go there and search on e-learning, and you'll get a list of all the various topics that we've already covered. Uh, either with a PDF download of the presentation or a WebEx recording so that you can watch that at your leisure right there on the website. If you are a New Jersey or New York resident, uh, you can earn continuing education credits uh, by attending this webinar. Uh, we simply ask that you complete the survey at the conclusion of the presentation. Well, before we start talking about the Assembly Manager extension, I thought it might be useful to just uh, talk a little bit about what an extension actually is and what, what does ACT stand for uh, in the, the ANSYS Toolkit. ACT stands for the Application Toolkit, Customization Toolkit within ANSYS. Uh, ACT is activated by an ACS license, that's the ANSYS Customization Suite license, and the ACT Toolkit will allow you to create custom extensions or custom uh, menu systems within the ANSYS mechanical environment. So if you've been in a situation where you wanted to add some additional functionality to Workbench, you had traditionally been doing it with a command block, you can now take that command block and using the uh, ACT, the Customization Toolkit, you can now make menu buttons for that so that it will appear uh, right there in the menu system. And rather than uh, having everyone that uses it need to understand what's happening with the, the APDL macro, you can actually have it be menu driven in mechanical. So it's quite useful in that regard. Uh, things to keep in mind from a licensing standpoint, only users that are developing the extensions will need an ACS license. Uh, they can then be shared with any standard user out there. Once that license or once that app, that extension is developed, uh, it can just be uh, extended out to whoever wants to use it, and there's no additional licensing required for that. There are several free ACT extensions that you can find on the customer portal of the ANSYS website. Uh, these are extensions that uh, people have uh, developed and then shared with ANSYS. Uh, if you go to the ANSYS customer portal and go go to the downloads pull down menu, you'll find the extension library and there's a whole list of these various extensions at that location. Uh, ANSYS has currently two ACT extensions that they are offering. Uh, these are these are offered uh, at at a price. Uh, the component mode synthesis or the CMS super elements extension can be purchased via, through ANSYS. Uh, and the Assembly Manager extension, the one that we'll be discussing today, actually comes with the ANSYS Customization Suite license. So if you have an ACS license, you'll get this. Uh, but if you wanted to get a hold of it in any regard and you, and you didn't want to develop other extensions, this can also be purchased separately. Uh, you can contact the, our local sales representatives, either Tony Salazzo or Andy Hughes, uh, for details on obtaining either of these two extensions. Once you have an extension, they're quite easy to install at version 14.5. You'll find there's a pull-down menu on the project page uh, that allows you to first install extensions and then manage which extensions you would like to include in your project. So in this case, we would start out by going right to the extensions pull-down, choosing Install, uh, browse to the selected extension files. Then to manage the extensions, we'll pull down the Manage Extension toolbar, and the, uh, the menu system will open up. And you'll then have the ability to check on or off the various extensions that you want to include in the current project. 
Now these will then be saved in the project file, so the next time you, you open up that particular project, the extensions will already be included and installed. As far as this particular extension, the Assembly Manager, uh, the basic procedure for using this is, is, is as follows. I'd like to just summarize this quickly, and then we'll go right into a demonstration of the actual extension. Uh, you simply start out by obviously installing the extension. Uh, then you go to se uh, separate mechanical files that have that extension installed, and you generate a mesh for these various files. Now, the idea here is that you're going to have one host file or one master file, and then you're going to take meshed models from other mechanical files and load them into that master file to create an assembly. Now, these, the connection can include material assignments, mesh settings, connections, coordinate systems, loads, and even name selections that you want to include in that assembly, and we'll show you how you can do that. So we start out by going to the individual component files, and we write out their information to a file that can be used by the assembly manager. Then we return to the host file and read those files in to build the assembly. One thing to be aware of, uh, the engineering data of the master component or the host file has to include all the materials that are going to be imported from the components. Otherwise, those components will just be assigned to the default structural steel uh, material. So a typical example where, where this might be useful is uh, something like a fan blade, where you spend a lot of time uh, and effort meshing the actual fan blade component, and then you would like to bring in multiple copies of that uh, into an assembly file, the host file for that being the, the rotor for that particular uh, part of the engine. So I'm going to demonstrate that now. We'll switch over to the mechanical environment. So let me move my uh, process out of the way here. Okay, so on the left-hand side, uh, we have our mesh file for our particular fan blade. Uh, so you'll see we have a series of mesh controls. Uh, generally, when we're, we're meshing this type of geometry, uh, companies have very specific procedures that they use and very specific uh, mesh controls that they have for, for their particu particular blades that they're meshing. Uh, and again, what we'd like to do is be able to copy that mesh multiple times into discrete locations uh, in the assembly file, in this case, a section of the rotor that I have here on the right-hand side. Now, in order to do this, what, what we're going to do is create on the, uh, on the host side a series of coordinate systems that will represent the orientation of that blade with respect to the original global coordinate system of the component. So I don't do anything on the component end. I just keep, it, it, I keep everything defined with, in, it, with respect to the global system. But when I want to bring that in and position and orient that with respect uh, to the host, uh, I'm going to create local systems that will align it. So in this case, I've just simply rotated the blade. The blade is already at that particular radius in this case, and I've rotated the blade such that it's going to um, sit right in one of these cavities in the rotor. So let's show you how you do that. Again, we start out uh, on the component side, and you'll see up here in the upper uh, left-hand corner, we have the assembly manager extension installed. And there are two options. Uh, this is the option to assemble parts. This is the option to write out data to be imported into uh, the host file. So we're, we're going to begin with that. We're going to write out the uh, <clears throat> assembly files for the blade. So I click on that icon. And it prompts me to select the items that I'd like to include in that assembly. Uh, we're going to leave all of the various items on by default. Uh, you'll notice we have a series of mesh settings over here on the component side. Uh, I also have a pressure and a frictionless support, as well as a name selection. And we'll see how those all come in to the assembly. Now, I need to tell it where I want to uh, write those files to. And this is an, an important part of the process, because we're need, going to need to reference that location when we return to the host file. So if I click on the Browse button here, I'm going to go to a directory that I know I'm going to be able to find again, something that I generally have a problem with in most cases. So I have to be very careful where I put these. Uh, and I'm going to create, in this case, in my fan blade directory, I'll create a new folder, and I'm going to call that blade1. I click OK and export the data. It's now going to write all of the various uh, pieces of data from this model to this uh, location, blade1. And when that is complete, I will then get a, a window indicating that the various files have been created. And again, it tells you right on the bottom, don't rename these files. Uh, they're going to need all four of them to bring that information into the host file. So that's it on the component side. We're essentially done. Uh, we can move our blade out of the way here. And let's go over to our, uh, our host file. So here we are on the rotor side. Uh, now that we've had those uh, component parts written out, we can come back to the assembly manager and this time use the assembly icon. 
we click on that, and a window will open up where we define uh, the various components, uh, the, the location of those source files, and then the coordinate system that we're going to be using to import those quantities. So we'll start by adding a row. And this is, this is much like the, uh, the name selection manager. If anyone's had the, uh, an opportunity to use the worksheet, you create multiple rows. You can make rows active or inactive. And you can basically uh, uh, customize and just continuously change this um, until you get your assembly built to your satisfaction. So we'll start out with our first row here. The first thing that we need to tell it is where that source file is located. So I go back to that location that I just identified. Manager, and Blade, and there's Blade 1 right there. Right, so it has the files. It tells me it's ready to go. I need to give it a target coordinate system, but otherwise, by default, it's going to use the global system. So we'll specify Blade 1 in this case. So we start out by using the first button here, Update Geometry and Mesh. We'll click on that. And that will instruct it to go out, find the geometry and the mesh files that are associated with that blade. So as you can see, it's going out now. It's reading. And let's just move our assembly manager out of the way and see what we got here. Well, if I turn off my mesh, we'll see the mesh obviously came in. And we go up to the geometry. I have the material types displayed. Uh, you'll see that I had structural steel for the rotor by default. And I had used an Inconel material uh, for the fan blade. So that material designation was maintained when I brought that uh, new geometry and mesh into the assembly model. Again, that was uh, that required me to additionally, at the beginning, make sure that Inconel was included in the engineering data for the host file. So now that we have our, uh, as, oh, as I mentioned before, these can be inactive or inactive rows, so it's pretty easy to basically reverse your process. You can just take the blade out if you decided you didn't want it in there anymore. Uh, or in this case, simply just add it back in. So uh, just by making these rows active or inactive and regenerating, uh, it performs the operations for you. OK, so we have the geometry, and we have the mesh. We have the material assignment. But uh, you'll notice that if I click on my mesh controls here, the mesh controls are all associated to the rotor. So we haven't actually brought in any of the local mesh controls for the fan blade itself. Uh, if we wanted to mesh that fan blade locally, at this particular point, we'd have to redefine the mesh controls that would be used to do that. Well, we've already defined them once in the host file, so it makes no sense to go through that all over again. Uh, instead, what we can do, since we wrote out all that information, is simply go to the Update Model button and click on that, subsequent to the geometry and mesh import. So that goes back to the mechanical environment. Uh, grabs the additional, and in this case, I asked it for everything, so I'll be getting uh, mesh controls. I'll be getting boundary conditions and name selections in addition to the geometry and the mesh. So we'll give this a moment here to catch up with us. See, it's updating the bit database, so it's actually adding all of this information into the host database on the mechanical side. So let's see what's different now. We open up the mesh control. Uh, in addition to the original rotor meshing controls that we had, there's also a series of imported mesh controls. And if I click on those, you'll see those are all the mesh controls that are relevant to the blade itself. So we can bring in multiple copies of this blade. Uh, and if we import the uh, material, the model data as well, we'll be able to modify uh, the individual settings for a particular blade. So let's say we, we wanted to make the mesh finer on one blade versus the others. You can simply do that now locally within the assembly file. So all that information is brought across. On the name selection side, let's open that up. I had a name selection for the blade root, so that comes across now. I can scope uh, a result quantity to that if I wanted to. Uh, basically, all the information that we would, that we used in the setup now can be can be accessed at the assembly level. Uh, lastly, we have the import pressure on the leading face of the blade, and then I also had a frictionless support that also came across just to illustrate uh, the capabilities. So that's the uh, that's a quick. Um, a demonstration of how you bring a, a single component in. What if we had a situation where we'd like to bring in a pattern of components? Well, at this point, I'm going to switch over to a different model. I'll pop up uh, a model, in this case, of a bolted channel. Give me one moment here. So now we have a section here, an assembly of, of, of a channel with a basically a channel and a cover associated with it. Uh, what we'd like to do now is bring in bolts, um, bring those bolts in to fill in a particular pattern. So the basic procedure that we begin with is the same. We go to the, the individual uh, bolt component file. 
and we write out all the information. Now, here on the um, component or the assembly side, I simply make one coordinate system for that center point for the bolt, and I know what the offsets are and the number of copies that I need for the particular pattern. So let's drag this over here so we can see it. Let's return to the assembly manager. And instead of just bringing in that single file, let's bring it in as a pattern this time. So I go to my source file for my bolt, which is located over here. I indicate that the location for that first bolt is going to be CSIS1. Now I could click on import geometry right at this point, and the same thing would happen as, as did with the blade. But let's do something a little more uh, uh, fancy at this point. Oops, Hit the wrong button there. All right, so now let's go and say we're going to add in a pattern. When you click on the pattern button, it brings up the, uh, the pattern um, user interface. Uh, we're just going to call this the bolts in this case, the name of our pattern. The base import is going to be import one. That's the import that's found here, uh, the tag name of that import of the first bolt. And I have a choice with the pattern tool between linear and rectangular patterns. So in this case, I'll pick on the rectangular pattern, and I'll specify the offsets, in this case, in the x and then the z directions. So in the x direction, I'm going to have an offset of 1.5 inches. Oops, that would be 10.5, 1.5. And I'm just going to have one copy in that x direction. Uh, in the z direction, I'm going to have an offset of 3 inches and I'm going to create three copies of that. So that should fill out the bolts in my pattern. Click on the Add button. You'll see it, it's going through. It's finding, based on those offsets, those locations where the bolts are going to be placed, and creating, you'll notice in the outline tree, a coordinate system for each one of those bolt locations. Click on Update Geometry and Mesh. The same thing's going to happen. It copies in the initial bolt and then basically or, or imports the initial bolt and then copies it to the specified location. Once again, the material designations are maintained provided that the host file contains all the materials of the components. So here we are with our bolts. Now one other thing of note on the bolt side uh, was that I have a, a bonded contact connection uh, between the nut and the bolt. Well that's also something that I can import. Now that I've imported the geometry and the mesh, I can go to the next step where I update the model. And we'll see that in addition to uh, that geometry, we'll also have, now you can see over here in the outline tree, import for the contacts. That's going to be the uh, bonded contact designation for each one of those bolt to nut uh, components in that assembly. Let's open up the connections here. And I have, in addition to my original contact on just the, the channel assembly, uh, I now have the contacts for all the various bolts uh, that I brought in via the assembly manager. Now, ideally, in this case, you'd like to have bolt pretension if possible. Uh, you'll notice that no bolt pretension was brought across. That's something that's not yet supported by the assembly manager. However, if you're familiar with the object generator at version 14, uh, you can use that in its place. So let's say we're going to add in a bolt pretension here. So we'll hide the channel body. Uh, I'm going to add in a bolt pretension to this first bolt in a standard fashion. In insert bolt pretension. Uh, we'll give it a value, in this case 100 pounds. And now I can use the object manager by simply selecting the remaining surfaces where I'd like to copy this to. Coming up to the top of the screen here, we'll see the version 14.5 object generator. Click on that and just indicate that I want to copy the selected item, the bolt pretension to the selected geometry. Click on Generate, and we very quickly add our bolt pretensions to each one of the bolts in the assembly. So that's really all there is to it. Uh, there is some consistency required on the part of the user to make sure that the uh, coordinate systems are aligned correctly. But other than that, uh, you can take uh, me mechanical meshes or mechanical models from um, either uh, the same project in a different mechanical system or completely different projects. Uh, they all have to be at the same revision of ANSYS, obviously, but you can have separate people working on different components and easily bring them into the working environment.